Dear Pepe, The lopes are dragging me boat to the river, so I'm getting a head start on these daily letters. Love you lots, Shanty. Ah, welcome back, Mire. It's been a while now. Oh, Shanty hopes you've been well. Truly. Oh, of course. You're here to listen to the rest of all Shanty's tale of how he shouldered his ship, the Bocean Blue, from his pappy's jackalope ranch to that big, beautiful, briny blob we call the sea. Well, your Shanty is a very busy Shanty, but perhaps there's room in his hectic schedule for you, Midi. Last you heard, young Shanty had just arrived at the river with his boat and several dozen jackalopes who had kindly pulled the bush and blue across miles and miles of miserably rocky ground to get there. Upon arrival at the riverbank, the raw excitement emanating from young Shanty was outdone only by the relief of the lopes, who knew they wouldn't be pulling any more boots for the rest of their leaping lives. Young Shanty was elated for the chance to finally see flowing water with his own eyes. But, upon closer inspection, Shanty realised that the river was nothing more than a piddly green trickle. Ugh. Before Shanty could even turn around to suggest that, he and the lopes continued to carry their aquatic encumbrance downstream in search of a more cable current. Every single jackalope had bit their bindings and began bounding back where they belonged. All but one, who stayed behind to shoot your shanty an incredulous look, before doing the exact same thing. In hindsight, perhaps young shanty was being a selfish shanty, expecting the lobs to log that load that length. But, in shanty's defence, Wild jackalopes can run 169 miles in a single day. Comparatively, these lopes were lazy. Nonetheless, young Shanty was abandoned with a beached boat and a tiny trickle, left alone to ponder possible plans of proceeding. Shanty decided to scope out the area for the easiest way to get the ocean blue to viable waters. But the trickle only became thinner downstream. The so-called river went from damp to boon drays the rest of the bloody landscape in a matter of 50 paces, and young Shanty knew that the sea lay far beyond where a short hike could take him. He was stranded. Young Shanty mentally prepared a dejectedly ample back, wallowing in the ocean of his own self-pity. But he knew that he needed the sea, and somehow the sea needed him too. He couldn't simply abandon his destiny at the first inconvenience. This was merely a test of young Shanty's authenticity. He knew in his heart that he'd make it to the sea, even if he had to drag the boat to it himself. Young Shanty, now full of renewed vigour, made a stylish, confident pivot in the dehydrated riverbed, strutted forward, and looked up to see that the ocean blew was gone. Me baby boat. Taken in an instant. I was terrified. Your shanty sprinted to the vacant spot where the Boshan Blue used to be and frantically scoured the scene for its whereabouts. He did notice a hole shaped depression in the sand that stretched from the boat's previous position to somewhere further up the river. Shanty ran to follow the course of the concavity, knowing that the long depression in the sand would be nothing compared to the long depression he'd have to grapple with if he couldn't save the Boshan Blue. Whatever snatched Shanty's ship was surprisingly strong and speedy, as the boat's trail spanned a great distance alongside the green trickle, before the two eventually converged inside a colossal cave. Young Shanty assumed that this cave was the source of the pitiful excuse for a river, for the inside was as deep, damp, and dank as his old pappy's dusty panties. Your Shanty doesn't like making a habit of 
ridicule on his pappy's unique approach to fashion, but it certainly makes you wonder. Anyway, Young Shanty stood at the mouth of the cave, knowing that his boat would be somewhere inside. He was nervous, but knew that a moment's hesitation could be the difference between having his boat and not having his boat. So, with the caution of a starved jackalope with his sights on Sunday brunch, Young Shanty charged into the cave at top speed, immediately slipped on a wee pebble, and blacked out. When you open your eyes to find yourself in a warm and cosy cabin, constructed with a hodgepodge of sheet metal and wooden planks and beams, all illuminated by lantern light, while towering figures surround you, their appearance is obscured by the blur of your dizzy eyeballs. You'd most likely think you were still in one of them blacked out in the cave dreams that are so common nowadays. But as Shanty's eyes adjusted to the dim light that didn't quite reach the surprisingly lofty ceiling, he finally got a good look at the individual surrounded his incapacitated self. They were mer people, and bless my boots, they were incredible. Nothing like the pretty petite things with flimsy fishy fins like I hear about in fairy tales. No, they were massive, at least 20 feet tall. Their tremendously muscular torsos were joined to tails like great green serpents steadily slithering about the shack. Each one was covered head to fin in stunning iridescent scales that contained a cacophony of colours. They were absolutely awe-inspiring. Overwhelmed and confused, your shanty wanted to black out again, but the throbbing in his head compelled him to compose himself and collect the courage to cast his gaze upward. The faces of the Mar people were hardened, yet kind. Most of them looked elderly, and Shanti found himself admiring their wrinkled faces like he might a mountain or some age-old masterpiece, with an implicit reverence for their steadfast resilience. The Mar people were all staring back at him, and it seemed that they were almost as fascinated with your Shanti as your Shanti was fascinated with them. Young Shanti remembered the bush in blue, and frantically tried to communicate his concern to the Mar people. Shanti didn't know this at the time, but very rarely does an ocean dweller speak Shanti, so no response was returned. <laughs> that was until one Mar woman, seemingly much younger than the rest, beckoned the others to back away so that she could make eye contact with young Shanti. There was an awareness in her eyes, that the other Mar people didn't have. Shanti found a twinkle of ancient understanding that somehow imparted his plight to her. Then, as if by instinct, the crowd dispersed and allowed your Shanti to exit the cabin. The enormity of the interior and the nervous jitter in his legs made the walk unbearably long. But once Shanti stepped outside the enormous door, he found himself back in the deep dark cave, with the potion blew beside him as young Shanty embraced his boat and bawled his eyes out from relief. He looked back at the jumbled collection of scrap that was the Mar people's cabin and realised that if Shanty hadn't ran into the cave and blacked out when he did, his beloved potion blew would have been broken down and blended into that bloody box of a house. Shanty contemplated the cabin's inhabitants. What were these magnificent beings doing living in a cave cabin? Certainly the sea was the correct accommodation for creatures so big and beautiful. Young Shanty looked into the Mar woman's eyes again. This time, Shanty found a twinkle of profound sadness and longing. These people were trapped. The sea was miles and miles away, and the pitiful green trickle that led there couldn't possibly hydrate these humongous beings who would assuredly bake in the blazing hot sun. Your shanty didn't quite know how, but he had to find a way to help the Mar people back to where they belonged. 
Looking around at the many puddles, Shanti remembered that this cave was the source of the green trickle, which must have been a proper river at one time. Something must have blocked off the flow of the river somewhere in this cave, and young Shanti was going to find it. It didn't matter how far he had to go, Shanti quickly lit a lantern from the ocean blue and embarked on a dangerous spelunking expedition. Thankfully, he didn't have to spelunk too far, as the water was actually leaking from a shanty-sized hole in the cave wall, immediately next to the cabin. Ha! Huh. Young Shanty investigated the lantern-lit hole to find many scratches, bashes, and other such impressions in and around it. The expressions on the Mar people grew exasperated as they spectated the investigation, so Shanty suspected that they were simply too bloody big to solve the situation themselves. With a handsome, reassuring smile, young Shanty squeezed into the cave wall and crawled through the creeping current of water with a staunch resolve and sodden slacks. The pitch black space got increasingly tight and unpleasantly claustrophobic as Shanty inched ever closer to the end of the teensy weensy tunnel. One of the puny positives of the sopping situation was that there wasn't quite enough water to put out the lantern as it lit the way for the amateur contortionist known as Shanty. Finally, Young Shanty reached the end of the crawlway and discovered one final crack in the wall, just big enough for his head to fit through. Shanty gently dropped the lantern on the opposite side of the opening, and then popped his head through for a peep. By the barnacles in Shanty's briny beard, there were hundreds of small, slimy salamanders sickeningly sucking the stream from between the stones. Their vile mouths were vacuum sealed to the space between the rocks and their limbs were dangling and wobbling every which way. They were guzzling the entire river and leaving behind something a bit worse than water for old Shanty to crawl through. Ugh. Shanty aimed to pull the closest salamander off the wall, but found it was just out of reach, so he had no choice but to regroup and try something else. After crawling out of the apparent amphibian excrement, ugh, young Shanty set the lantern down by the tunnel, trudged past the expectant Mara people, and climbed into the bush and blue to find something that could feasibly separate some suckling salamanders from their steady supply. Before leaving his pappy's ranch, young Shanty made sure to bring all the tools he might need while living on the sea. Pots for cooking, soup for washing up, and, of course, a pole for fishing. That would be the perfect way to whack some manders. But first, Shanty needed to find a way to get out of the tunnel before the sudden rush of water took him. Shanty knew that there was some rope in his tool chest, which he could tie around himself so one of the mer people could yank him out of the hole when the water started flowing. So, Shanty snatched his fishing pole and cracked open his tool chest to find not just a rope, but an entire bloody jackalope! Shanty called the other lopes lazy earlier, but this stowaway decided letting everyone else do the work would be a bit more relaxing. <laughs> well, she wasn't relaxing now. Let your Shanty tell you a fun fact about jackalopes. They hate unfamiliarity. It makes them, well, violent. So, after being kicked square in the face by the frenzied lope, Shanty watched the anxious animal abandon ship, bolt past the merfolk, and shoot straight into the salamander shaft. The silence that your Shanty shared with the mer people was palpable. They might have thought that this was part of the plan. Shanty braced himself and counted to twelve. If nothing happened by then, he'd go with the original plan. Nobody moved. Nothing happened. Young Shanty slowly relaxed his grip on the tool chest 
and carefully ambled off the bush and BOOM! The entire bloody wall erupted with gushing water and rocks and salamanders. Shanti was blown back into the boat and held on for dear life as the hasty waves propelled him and the mother people right through the cave with truly exquisite force. Then, just as Shanti was about to fly his boat through the mouth of the cave, a small pebble collided with his head and he blacked out again. Shanti awoke to the sun's heat beaten down on his sprawled out body, which was cooled by the soft, salty breeze combined with his overall dampness. He sat up, rubbed his eyes, coddled his aching forehead, and recognised the oddly rhythmic oscillation beneath his buttocks. Young Shanti steadied his quivering limbs as he stood up on the shifting surface of the ship. The Boshan Blue was finally at sea. But before young Shanti could stare longingly at the vast expanse that laid before him, he noticed that a deeply shaken and deeply soaked jackalope who must have landed on the ship along with a few salamanders, was once again startled by a breaching creature portside. It was the young-looking merwoman from the cave. She swam up to the ship, and the rest of the mer people followed suit. Your shanty could sense the joy and gratitude in their enormous eyes for being reunited with the sea as we were all smiling at each other for finally making it home. The main mar woman met Shanti at eye level and solemnly stared into his very soul. Shanti found one final twinkle in her eyes. It was warm, and it felt as though colour and light were filling young Shanti's entire being. Then, just in his mind, young Shanti heard the mar woman speak. The sea needs you, and now it will never be without you. Shanti found himself too transfixed on the words to say goodbye to the mer people, who dove deep down below the waves and disappeared, leaving Shanti and his jumpy jackalope to begin life anew on board the Boshin Blue.